I want to tell you a bit about this book, which I wrote in 2001. As you see, it's called Alfred and Arthur. The Alfred in question lived to become poet laureate and was one of the most celebrated Englishmen of his day. He was 83 when he died and he was by then known to everybody as Alfred Lord Tennyson. Arthur could also have been destined for glory but unfortunately his life was cruelly terminated by a, a brain hemorrhage in 1833 when he was only 22 years old. However, just four years before that, that these two men met uh, at Trinity in Cambridge in 1829 when both of them entered for the College Poetry Prize. Not surprisingly, Alfred was the winner, but what mattered to him much more than winning a competition was that this had been the means of bringing him and Arthur together and in his view, the two of them were inseparable from then on. Uh, right from the beginning, there had been a remarkable rapport between them. The two of them had been brought up quite differently. Alfred was largely educated at home by his father, who was a clergyman but also a poet. Arthur had been at Eton. He'd been a close friend of uh, Gladstone's and was the son of a distinguished historian, Henry Hallam. He'd just enjoyed a long trip to Italy before coming to Trinity. Alfred hadn't been out of Lincolnshire before he came to Cambridge. However, they complimented each other admirably. Uh, Arthur admired Alfred tremendously because uh, he, he sensed here the poetic genius of his friend and uh, Alfred was uh, full of uh, admiration for Arthur because he seemed so much more experienced, so much more travelled, seemed to know so much more. But there was much more in it than that. Quite simply, Alfred had fallen in love with Arthur. He made this quite explicit in the following year when the two of them travelled together to the Pyrenees to make contact with a group of Spanish rebels who were being helped by a group of students at Cambridge. But it was just the two of them and on the way back uh, they visited a valley in France uh, called Cauteretz which they found absolutely enchanting and they rested there for a while. And this inspired Alfred to write a sonnet, Check Every Outflash, which ends with the dramatic line, When in this valley first I told my love. Later, Alfred sent a copy of this poem to Arthur, and he did so in the knowledge that his love was reciprocated. Now, it suited everybody to assume that this love was simply the deep affection of one male friend for another. It wasn't, and Alfred wasn't going to have that. In 1842, nine years after Arthur's death, he published a poem, Love and Duty. And this is about the heartache of a passionate lover who has doggedly to accept duty's stern, heartless refusal to allow the lovers to consummate their illicit passion. Now this poem greatly puzzled Stopford Brooke, who was Tennyson's first biographer. He observed that the lover's dilemma was inherently immoral, and he goes on to deplore, in his words, the predominance of the man in the matter. It's he that feels the most. It's he that directs the whole business of duty. He cannot get his women of equal worth with his men. Now if Brooke had looked more closely at the poem, he would have noticed that there isn't a woman in it, not even a feminine pronoun. Like almost every subsequent reader of the poem, Brooke had also completely failed to take account of a cryptic line which occurs right in the middle of the poem. If the sense is hard, to alien ears, I did not speak to these. 
Now why should the sense be hard to alien ears? For the very good reason that Tennyson is talking about what Oscar Wilde was later to call the love that dare not speak its name, the love which had cost the lives of many Englishmen during this period. In 1850, 17 years after Arthur's death, Arthur published anonymously at first the longest love poem written by a man for a male friend in the language. Contrary to all predictions, In Memoriam was an immediate bestseller and it was instrumental in securing for Arthur the vacant post of Poet Laureate. It was also the poem uh, which, because it brought money in, enabled uh, Alfred to marry Emily Selwood, to whom he had been engaged for a number of years. In this poem, Alfred portrays himself convincingly as a desolated widow cruelly separated by the death of her loving husband. He does this so well that uh, when the poem was still anonymous, a reviewer conjectured that these touching lines evidently come from the full heart of the widow of a military man. Uh, he couldn't have read that very carefully because the poem goes on to speak very directly to uh, Alfred's bride-to-be, Emily Selwood. And he says to her, If not so fresh, with love as true, I, clasping brother hands of her, I could not, if I would, transfer the whole I felt for him to you. Now that is quite astonishing, because uh, what he is doing is not merely equating his love for Arthur to that of a husband for his wife, he's actually confessing that to his bride-to-be that Arthur will always have pride of place in his heart. And so it turned out. Now I don't have time to tell you all the ways in which Arthur remained a living presence for Alfred right through his life. Um, when, when the Tennysons had their first son, Alfred called him Hallam. He paid two more visits to the Valley of Courtrids, where first he declared his love for Arthur. And so it goed, went on. But i will just close by telling you about a, a poem called Vastness, which Tennyson wrote just seven years before he died. Now this is uh, quite a grim poem. Uh, it's, it's very realistic. It, it's it's uh, conveying uh, this awful sense of being lost and alone in a vast universe. At the end, he sums it up like this. What the philosophies, all the sciences, poesy, varying voices of prayer, all that is noblest, all that is basest, all that is filthy, with all that is fair, what is it all, if we all of us end but in being our own corpse coffins at last, swallowed in vastness, lost in silence, drowned in the deeps of a meaningless past? What but a murmur of gnats in the gloom, or a moment's anger of bees in their hive. And then the last lines. Peace, let it be, for I loved him and love him forever. The dead are not dead.